Well, I don't want to wait much longer since we do have a packed agenda. Uh, but before I introduce our speakers, I do want to extend a big thank you to all of our incredible supporters, those in attendance and those who are not. You make our work possible and I'm very excited to share some of 2022's program highlights with you all. So we will hear about population education's latest resources for students and educators from our senior VP uh, for education, Pam Wasserman, Brian Dixon, our VP for media and government relations, and Yasmin Silva, our national field manager, will explain how we responded to changes in the repro rights advocacy landscape. And then to wrap up, Marion Starkey, our VP for communications, will give an overview of successful outreach efforts and share updates on our Global Partners Program. Now, if you have any questions you want to ask our speakers, please drop them in the Q&A box that is found at the bottom of your screen. We will get to those during the Q&A session. It's a, little, it's a short Q&A session since we have a lot to go over, but we will provide a red answer if we don't have time today. So on that note, I will go ahead and turn the floor over to you, Pam. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen. Uh, OK, can everyone see that? All right. Um, so I wanted to kind of give you an update on what we've been doing in the population education program uh, over the last year. And um, this year in review is a good exercise for me to kind of put some numbers together and, and see how much we've accomplished. And, um, and I, I hope, you, uh, hope you find it interesting. Um, so I know many of you on the call have been involved with our organization for a long time. So you, you probably know that uh, professional development for teachers and future teachers is a big part of the population education program and has been for, for a number of years. Um, during COVID, you know, we had to stop staff travel and do most of our sessions for teachers online. Um, so last year, um, as you can see, we, we, we got to a point where we were doing about half of them in person, half virtual. And I think as we move into 2023, um, you know, that's going, that's going to trend with more, more in-person events. So our staff, uh, was traveling in the fall where we have more trips planned for um, this semester. So um, we're looking forward to being out and about with, with the educational community. Um, we did over 500 workshops. Um, we won't have our final tallies um, for a couple of months because many of our workshops are done by um, volunteer trainers in the field, people who have been trained by us to do pop ed workshops in their local areas. So we have to wait until we get all of their follow-up to know what the final attendance was and how many workshops um, did indeed happen. But, but that's, a, that's a good guesstimate right there on the screen. And you can see that um, we gave workshops all over Northern America. Um, so you know, primarily we work in the US and Canada. Um, we do have you know, a, a few requests that come in internationally. Um, and about a fifth of our workshops are for a uh, very specific educational community, which are teachers in high school who teach two AP courses, um, AP Human Geography and AP Environmental Science. Um, so those take place during the summer. So it used to be um, that for pop ed, you know, things would slow down a little bit when the school year ended, but ever since we've been really active doing these, um, these workshops for teachers who are teaching AP courses with these um, college board sponsored um, sessions. Um, our summers are pretty busy too. Um, and then at the bottom of the screen, you can see the other thing we've been doing um, for several years now is a graduate level course for middle and high school teachers. We offer it um, in the summer and fall. The fall offering is over eight weeks and the summer offering is condensed. It's the same course, but it's done in four weeks in July. Um, and teachers can earn three graduate credits for that. And they get a, a really good deep dive into um, population studies and you know, how, to, how to teach it in their classes. Um, one thing that was really heartening um, in 2022, we were able to get back to doing our in-person Summer Leadership Institute. 
This is something that we've been doing for a number of years to train new volunteer trainers, uh, but we had to pause it in 2020 and 2021. So again, it was great to just be in person with a group of really dedicated educators. Um, this was held in July um, in Massachusetts this year, but the trainers came from all over the US and Canada. Um, for 2023, we're actually doing three of these events. I'll, I'll mention that when I get to our to the end of this uh, presentation. Um, we were also at a couple of major teacher um, conventions to exhibit last year. Another thing that got paused uh, in 2020 and 2021, but last year was the first year that some of the major teacher associations started having big conventions again. So um, because science and social studies are where most of the interest is for our materials, those are the big conventions that we go to. So you can see last year we were at NSTA, the Science Teachers Convention in Houston. And at the end of the year, we were at the Social Studies Convention in Philadelphia. And our booth, you know, we, we show our dot video um, that wheel you see, people can um, spin that and win curricula for their classroom. We make sure that um, no teacher who stops by goes away empty handed. Uh, we also do a lot of digital outreach. Um, you know, even before uh, we started doing webinars, we know that a lot of teachers discovered our materials on our websites. Um, our main teacher website, uh, populationeducation.org, if you haven't visited, I recommend perusing that and seeing all of the things that teachers can download for their classroom. Um, you can also now um, see some of the webinars that we recorded last year. Um, for our different marketing themes. So I put those up on the slide. Um, our, our marketing themes uh, last year were on air pollution, teaching about um, the sustainable development goals, social emotional learning and food and agriculture. And so every quarter of the school year, we um, had special blogs and, and activities for the classroom we would feature around the theme. And then we'd have a webinar that teachers from any location could could join. Um, and if you go to that URL that's up on the screen, you can also see what's coming up for our first marketing quarter of the year. Um, it's going to be a, a webinar we're doing next month, tying in public health themes with, with our population education materials. Uh, we also have uh, demo videos of um, you know, some of our activities that, that you can look at, that teachers can see um, how to do the activities with their own students. And um, we put up at least one blog a week on different topics. Um, we did quite a bit around uh, world population reaching 8 billion, understanding um, the new projections from the UN. So those were some of the ones you might want to look at from the fall. And um, we really try to tap into lots of different themes that teachers are talking about. Um, related to the new projections, we've also updated our worldpopulationhistory.org site. This is where the dot video is, is housed, the six minute video that shows the history of world population growth. Um, and there's interactive features on that. So um, we had all of that updated to reflect the new projections um, and also um, you know, showing um, the 8 billion mark being reached um, late last year. Um, and then I wanted to just talk a, a, for a moment about our student video contest, because this is, a uh, one of the most fun activities that our program does each year because it really engages students directly and through their teachers. Um, and we've been doing this since world population reached 7 billion. That's when we started doing um, the contest. Um, it has an international reach. Uh, last year we had, um, we had participants from 48 countries. Uh, one of our winners you can see on this screen is Mar Mauritania. Um, and last year we had over 2,600 entries, but even more students in that work on the videos because many of them do them in teams. Um, and last year's uh, uh, themes were ocean health, um, food and agriculture, and, um, and urbanization. Um, so that was, um, that was judged and all of the media came out in May. And now we're on to um, our new contest. And it used to be called the World of 7 Billion. Now it's called the World of 8 Billion Student Video Contest. 
Um, and the submission deadline is coming up soon, um, February 22nd. So you can see um, the, the themes on the screen for this year are climate change, gender equality, and waste. And uh, they're cash prizes for students. It's open to middle and high school students. Um, and we, we put a lot of content up on the contest website for teachers and students to give them some background information on these topics, lots of links for other sources for their research. Because really, while we're judging the final product, uh, a lot of the learning goes into the process over a period of months as students are researching and putting these videos together. Um, if you go to that website, worldof8billion.org, you can also look at all the winning videos from prior years too. So I encourage you to do that. And then finally, just kind of giving you a preview of what we're working on in 2023. A um, couple of products related to the 8 billion milestone. Um, we have a, a cartogram poster that um, shows the size of countries based on the size of population on, on the screen. And the last one was done in 2015, but we, we're updating it now to reflect uh, a world of 8 billion. So that'll be ready by the summer. Uh, we have another poster that has a timeline of world population history on one side, and the flip side has a lot of infographics. Um, you can see the, the one on the screen says a quick trip to 7.6 billion. That's the last update. So we'll have a new 8 billion version coming out soon. And we're hard at work on updating our K through five curricula for teachers who teach elementary grades. Um, and this is uh, very interdisciplinary. It's, it's math, language, art, science, and social studies, and showing um, teachers how to, you know, how to present issues we work on that's age appropriate for the elementary classroom. Um, and finally, at the bottom, I, just a few other things coming up, our training institutes for new trainers. Um, this year will be in Seattle and New Orleans this summer, and then one in St. Louis in September. Um, because of the pandemic, we had a lot of teachers in the network who've retired or moved on. And so we really wanted to use 2023 as a rebuilding year to do more training events to get more new teachers involved in the network. Uh, we also have some new Spanish language materials coming out and a packet of lessons specifically for teachers who teach English language learners in TESOL classes for, for all different languages. Um, and then we're continuing to add to our digital tools um, for educational technology tie-ins um, for all of our curriculum materials, K through 12. Um, so with that, I will, uh, I will stop sharing and turn it back over to you, Stephanie. Thank you, Pam. I will turn it over to Brian. Thanks everyone, uh, really happy you were able to join us today. Um, I don't think I'll take as long as Pam's and hopefully leave a little time for questions at the end. Um, but I'm gonna spend a lot of time talking about the work of our, of our 501c4 organization, the Population Protection Action Fund, um, where we do most of our lobbying and we also engage in political work. Um, almost everything on the policy side gets dealt with in appropriations. Um, the funding, and, and it was an incredibly frustrating year last year where we, um, despite having uh, a president who was supportive and a House uh, who was very supportive, uh, the Senate um, remains a challenge in their dysfunction and their inability to really get anything done. And um, an, an opposition party that was willing um, to shut down the whole government in order to block uh, funding for things like family planning programs, uh, both domestically and internationally. So we ended up with uh, pretty much a status quo, um, despite our best hopes of getting getting more than that. Um, you know, the, the, the political, the, the year was sort of blown up in the summer when the Supreme Court acted to, to overturn the, the right to abortion across the United States. And, um, that changed uh, a lot, both policy-wise and the, the issues that were brought up in Congress. Um, 
Several bills were introduced right away after that to, to protect the right to abortion. Um, they all passed the House. They failed in the Senate. Um, but we're, and then we then came the election where everyone was expecting a big um, Republican uh, wave to come in. But I think I think it's clear now in retrospect that the Dobbs uh, decision overturning uh, abortion rights um, changed that narrative as well. Um, turned sort of the, the predicted red wave into a trickle. Uh, and um, our, you know, Population Connection Action Fund was doing a lot of work on the ground uh, in these elections. Uh, we endorsed, uh, let me just get the numbers right in front of me. Uh, we endorsed 19 candidates um, running for Senate, 15 of them uh, were elected. Uh, and in the House, we endorsed 56 candidates running for the House and 46 of them won, uh, including a pretty big uh, split in Ohio where Greg Landsman defeated um, longtime uh, reproductive health and family planning opponent, uh, Steve Shabbat uh, in the Cincinnati area. Um, that's been a seat that Shabbat has been holding on to for a while despite um, the political trends there. Uh, you know, we, Yasmin will talk a little bit more about the specific work we did, but we we really focused some some pretty significant effort in in three states in Arizona, Nevada, and Pennsylvania uh, to to work to to elect several of our key champions, um, both in the House and Senate. In in Arizona, uh, we were focusing on Mark Kelly uh, for Senate. Um, Greg Stanton in the Phoenix area for the Hong, for the House, as well as um, Ruben Gallego and Kirsten Engel, um, all but Kirsten Engel won. She was running in a uh, gerrymandered district to replace a longtime champion currently in Congress, Andrew Kirkpatrick. Uh, and in Pennsylvania, we were working um, to help John Fetterman uh, and Susan Wild in the Lehigh Valley part of Pennsylvania, uh, and in Nevada. Of course, everyone was in the Vegas area. So um, Catherine Cortez Masto, uh, Susie Lee, Dina Titus, uh, and Stephen Horsford, all of whom uh, were reelected, um, and all of whom have been incredibly vocal champions for the programs that will address population growth around the world, for investments in family planning, for things to, for, for permanent repeal of the global gag rule, which um, you may know, uh, prevents support for any organization which uh, uses its own private funding for to provide abortions, uh, offer counseling or referrals or, on abortion, or to support um, legal abortion as a policy matter in their own countries. Um, so uh, we're we're excited about some of the some of what happened in the election. A little less so. And the other, we also did, and what part of what makes us excited is some polling we did of voters in the 22, 2022 midterm, um, where pretty solid majorities of voters of both parties um, oppose any future restoration of the global gag rule, uh, support repealing the longstanding Helms Amendment, which um, has been. Uh, enforced as a total ban on the use of U.S. funds for safe abortion around the world, and which has really hamstrung providers uh, in the developing world and may and, and undermine efforts to improve healthcare broadly. Uh, and um, finally, we we did some polling on this question of allowing U.S. in the U.S. of allowing pharmacists to simply refuse to fill prescriptions for birth control and other reproductive health medicines and um, pretty overwhelming majority, bipartisan majorities uh, find that idea to be utterly abhorrent. Um, it's been the nearly 80% of voters who oppose that and who are strongly inclined uh, to vote against candidates who support allowing that to happen. Uh, so while we definitely face new challenges in the House in 23, uh, I think there's a lot of opportunities to just push these issues forward and to to get candidate get members on the record uh, I will also just uh, point out there's a 
there's a special election for the House coming up in a month in Virginia to fill a seat in the Richmond, Virginia area. Um, Population Protection Action Fund has endorsed State Senator Jennifer McClellan for that seat. McClellan in the in the Virginia State Legislature has been uh, the most outspoken and most effective champion of reproductive rights uh, in that state. So we're looking forward to to a new Democrat joining the the already incredibly tight uh, House, um, and we're trying to figure out exactly what this very narrow majority for the Republicans is going to mean. Uh, the speaker fight, I think, is a preview of what's coming over the next two years of a lot of chaos, a lot of inability to get stuff done. Uh, we're going to see how it really plays out, I think, in this on this question of the debt limit, which I guess the, the United States reached today, and how that how how the Republican Party in the House deals with that, and how many people are going to peel off. We're also going to be looking to peel off a few Republicans. We only need five. Um, one of them, at least, has made some some noises and said said some of the right things. I think uh, a couple of weeks ago, Nancy Mace from South Carolina was somewhat critical of Republican efforts in the House to to pass bills to to further restrict abortion rights in the United States. She said that if her colleagues were really interested in addressing this question, they wouldn't pass bills that were never going to go anywhere. They would take concrete efforts like expanding access to contraceptives. So we're going to see if she can match the words with action and try to find a way to give her a chance to, to vote that way. Um, so stay tuned. Uh, and with that, I think I'll, uh, I'll stop and pass it to the next. Thank you, Brian. Hi, everyone. My name is Yasmin Silva. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the National Field Manager at Population Connection. Um, I am going to expand um, a bit and add more color um, to some of the topics that Brian laid out. Um, a lot of the work that the field and advocacy team um, also takes place through Population Connection Action Fund in service of our C4 work. Um, so in 2022, um, we really, our, our first major action for the field team um, was kicking off with our annual Capitol Hill Days, which is our advocacy conference that we hold every year. Um, in 2022, um, we once again held it virtually um, and had multiple sessions spread out over six days. Um, and the purpose of Capitol Hill Days um, last year and, and every year <laughs> um, is to help participants um, really realize the influence of global and domestic reproductive health policies, um, help them navigate the complex relationship between population growth and climate, uh, help participants perform their transform, excuse me, their personal stories into effective advocacy tools, um, and to help them educate their local communities, their friends and family about the need for reproductive rights, both in the United States and abroad. Um, so we had some a really amazing slate of speakers last year. Um, Representative Barbara Lee, who is a strong reproductive rights champion, provided welcome remarks on the importance of funding international family planning and permanently repealing the global gag rule. Um, her address came right before um, a panel discussion with Planned Parenthood Federation of America's Director for Global Advocacy, Caitlin Horrigan. Um, and law professor, as well as Population Connection Action Fund and Population Connection board member, Dara Purvis. Um, and during their talk, the two addressed the most pressing challenges to global reproductive, the global reproductive health movement. And they also um, connected the dots by laying out the most effective advocacy and legal strategies moving forward. Um, other speakers included Dr. Jalicia Jolly, um, who is a professor of American studies and black studies at Amherst College, um, as well as Melvin Oyo, um, who is the founder and executive director at Hope for Kenya Slum Adolescence Initiative and a Population Connection board member, who I believe is joining us today. So um, Dr. Jolly and Melvin really highlighted the critical need to increase funding for international family planning and to make sure that 
Here in the United States, we passed the Global HER Act um, that will overturn the global gag rule and help those around the world have access to life-saving medical services. MNR Vice President Tanya Stewart helped train activists in the art of storytelling and helped them really understand how storytelling and narratives can help bridge the cultural and social divides and help people share why they care so much about this issue to bring other people in. Um, and our final session, we were joined by Sarah Lara and Joan Castro, um, who were really, their panels focused specifically on the connections between climate change, population, and reproductive health. So really an amazing and well-rounded group of panels, um, which helped lead all of our participants to have really strong narratives and um, reset their goals around the lobby meetings that Population Connection Action Fund holds with members of Congress at the end to help advocate for those pieces of legislation that I and Brian have mentioned. Um, so that was Capitol Hill Days. We are moving in 2023. We are in the planning stages of our next annual Capitol Hill Days. Um, we are really excited for the potential speakers we're bringing on this year as well. Um, that sign up form will be released in the next few weeks. So I really hope if you attended last year, you'll attend again. And if you haven't attended yet, it is a really powerful event. Um, and I hope you'll consider joining us. So um, the really big moment I would say that Brian mentioned in 2022 was the devastating Supreme Court decision of Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization. And so again, our sister organization, Population Connection Action Fund, we rapidly responded by helping educate folks in the population, um, population connection community around what this meant um, for our work. So um, we hosted Dara Purvis, again, law professor and Population Connection and Population Connection Action Fund board member um, with a rapid response um, discussion about what does a post rural world look like. Um, and in addition, we also um, invited medical professionals, lawyers, and humanitarians from Sub-Saharan Africa to really discuss how domestic policies here in the US on reproductive rights influence the reproductive rights landscape in other countries at our event titled Beyond Our Borders, How the Fall of Roe Impacts Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, as brought, so again, focusing mostly on our C4 work, um, we deployed organizers on the ground in the key states that Brian mentioned, namely Arizona, Nevada, and Pennsylvania, to have conversations with constituents and really help push forward the campaigns of those candidates that Brian mentioned. Population Connection Action Fund hosted phone banks. Um, we helped connect folks to canvassing opportunities in their communities, um, all in service of electing those reproductive rights champions that will help us pass those really important legislative milestones to help achieve the goals of our organizations. Um, and wrapping up in 2022, um, I attended the International Conference on Family Planning alongside members of the communication team. So I'm sure Marion will speak a little more to this, um, as well as with our board member, Melvin, who I mentioned before. Um, we had a booth in the main hall. Um, the conference was happening in Pattaya City in Thailand. Um, and in that booth, we shared population connections, views and work with other attendees. Uh, we connected with organizations from across the world who are also advocating for an integrated population health and environment perspective. Um, we had lots of information, both for people to take away through flyers and downloaded content um, and different ways to get in touch with us so we can continue those partnerships. And it was really wonderful to see how people across the globe are advocating in their own contexts and in their own countries. Um, but also it was really important to hear firsthand just how important they saw our work here in the US to eliminate the global gag rule and advocate for expanded family planning funding was. Um, and so we really hope to be able to continue to partner with organizations abroad and further our impact going into 2023. Um, and I'm really heartened um, most of the legislative wins that Brian mentioned, I think 
will really set us up, us and our activists and all of you up well um, through Population Connection Action Fund, our sister organization, to continue pushing hard on that legislation that will really make the difference. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Marin. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Marion Starkey. I'm the Vice President for Communications here at Population Connection. I'm one third of the communications team. Um, you're all probably pretty familiar with Hannah Evans, who's our senior analyst, and she does a lot of speaking engagements for us. And then Olivia Nader is our communications manager who joined us back in May. Um, I'm going to share a few slides. Let's see, okay. Um, so the first thing I wanted to talk about was media, um, earned media. Um, this is the question that I receive most often from members, people wondering why isn't population in the news more? Um, why are all of these environmental articles being written all the time without any mention of population? Um, and in fact, I've actually gotten, I think three or four emails this week already asking whether we were going to prepare any responses to all of the articles that came out at the beginning of the week about China's population peaking and beginning to decline. And of course we did um, on Tuesday, send out three different letters to the editor, to the New York Times, uh, the Washington Post and to Time. Um, so I just wanted to give show a list of the media mentions that we actually succeeded in getting. So this is a combined list of pieces that we wrote ourselves or, or I should say, and pieces that um, we didn't write, but that mention us by name. Um, so you can see that we got, you know, a pretty, a pretty good amount of media attention last year. Certainly our attempts to get media um, outweigh our success at getting media. We, we submit letters to the editor all the time. Um, and sometimes they get published and that's great. And sometimes they don't. Um, and we still think that it's a worthwhile activity to do because, you know, if editors are continuously receiving letters from us telling them, this is great, you wrote an article about deforestation um, in the Congo River Basin, but you failed to mention that population growth plays a part. Um, hopefully over time, enough of these reminders will, uh, will get reporters to start talking about this very critical um, and crucial component of so many environmental challenges that we face today. Um, similar to that, we actually have a program where we contact reporters directly who have written articles um, where they sort of missed an opportunity to talk about population. And so um, we contact them via email if we can find an email address for them. Um, sometimes we tweet at them. Uh, and we've been doing this for a couple of years. Um, I think we've gotten one response. But like with the letters to the editor, I think that this is an important thing to keep doing because even if we're not getting direct replies from these journalists, they're receiving our messages. And if we just keep on pestering them, um, hopefully they will come around and start recognizing this, you know, very important component um, of all of these issues that they're already writing about. So that's that sort of wraps up um, what we're doing over on the earned media side. Um, we're very busy all of the time working on that aspect um, of our communications work, and it just uh, you might not, a lot of it's behind the scenes, so you might just not be seeing um, as much as we are actually doing. Um, what's next? Okay, so where we do have control over getting published is on our blog, and you can see here, I don't expect people to actually be able to read all of these different blog post titles, but I just wanted to show that there were a lot. Um, like I said, we hired Olivia back in May and she's our designated blogger. Um, and so I suspect this year we'll have even more posts now that she'll be here for the full year. Um, but she has covered a variety of topics over the time that she's been here. And I would encourage you to go check it out. It's um, if you go to our webpage and click on the learn um, navigation at the top, the blog is in the drop down menu there. And you can see a couple a few years worth of archived blog posts. Um, something else that uh, keeps Olivia pretty busy is putting together really 
thoughtful and informative uh, social media posts and creating graphics and infographics to go with those posts. So if you're not already following us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, um, I would ask you to do so. It's also the place where you can find out most readily and timely um, when we have a new blog post on our website or when a new issue of the magazine that we produce comes out or when there's an event, one of these virtual events, we post those on social media as well. So um, if you are on social media, please follow our accounts and um, keep in touch with us and send us messages and we will respond to you. Um, well, I guess I have a slide on that too. And I, because I just wanted to show also here are our handles. So if you do wanna follow us, that's where you can find us. Um, but I also just wanted to draw attention to how many impressions we got last year. So impressions are just um, how many times our content like popped up on the screen in front of somebody's eyeballs. Um, so you can see for 2022, it was over 16 million times um, that people potentially saw our posts. Um, it's a huge increase over the year prior. A lot of that is probably due to the fact that we started occasionally paying to boost posts. We've realized, I mean, all, all organizations have realized that at this point, it's, uh, you know, it's pretty necessary to pay a, a small amount, and we're paying $25 at a time, um, to get your posts to appear in the algorithm that these social media platforms create and it's how they select who sees what in their news feeds. Um, so every now and then, if we have something that we feel is especially important that we wanna make sure actually reaches people, um, we'll pay a little bit of money to boost the post. So yeah, we, we had a lot more impressions last year than, um, than I suspect we've ever had, but certainly more than the year before. Um, as always, we published our quarterly magazine last year for issues. Um, those issues of the magazine focused on the reversal of Roe, which has already been discussed a couple of times today, um, the 8 billion milestone, and then the December issue um, was the, the theme was the massive family planning success in Thailand. Um, and we chose that theme to coincide with the International Conference on Family Planning that Yasmin talked about. Um, and for those of you who aren't subscribers to the magazine, we do have a digital version. Um, again, if you go to our website, click the Learn Navigation tab, it's, it's listed under there under Quarterly Magazine, and you can see um, digital versions that are just like HTML pages of each article, but you can also see the PDF of the print version. So um, if you don't already have a subscription, you can go there and see if maybe you'd like to have a, a subscription, and if you do, get in touch. Um, but one of the articles that is in the December issue of the magazine is a profile of this man that's on the cover here. And he's the person that kind of led Thailand's family planning revolution. Um, and when our staff and one board member were in Thailand, in Bangkok, um, well, in Pattaya City, which is like an hour south of Bangkok, in November, they actually stayed at a hotel that is part of the chain that he created called Cabbages and Condoms. Um, it started out as a restaurant, one restaurant, um, where the decor is all condom themed. Instead of dinner mints at the cash register, there are it's a bowl of condoms. Um, that is now a franchise. There are, I don't know, probably a dozen or more of these restaurants, mostly in Thailand, but a few um, outside of the country as well. And then there are also um, hotels and the hotel that they stayed at, it was the Birds and Bees Resort. And they actually got an opportunity to meet him. Um, he just happened to be there on the property one day. So, and then he was a, a keynote speaker at the conference, which is where that photo comes from. So anyway, check out our magazine if you don't already get it. Um, oh, well, and so, yeah, Yasmin already talked about this. One thing I did want to mention is that, um, Hannah Evans, who does a lot of public speaking for us, uh, did speak on a panel at ICFP. Um, it was a panel that was hosted by Population Matters, which is a group um, pretty similar to ours in the UK. Um, and her fellow panelists were colleagues from organizations in India and the Philippines that um, we had made connections with, you know, a few years ago. And so, um, yeah, that was really exciting to, to have our organization included in an official conference event. Um, and one thing that I wanted to mention about 
this, I guess, is that after the conference ended, Hannah actually took a couple of weeks and did two separate week-long site visits. Um, first, she flew to Nepal and visited RUDUK, um, and I can never remember what that acronym stands for, but it's rural something, 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 something. And um, it's a wonderful organization. They do really great work. A lot of it revolves around girls' education, but also um, safe drinking water in rural parts of the country. And she got to go for a week and um, visit different projects around that country. And then she flew from there to the Philippines, um, where she visited PFPI, which is the um, PATH Foundation Philippines Incorporated, I think is what the I stands for. Um, and that's an organization run by Joan Castro, who if you have been to our virtual events before, you've probably heard her speak. She was um, one of the panelists at Capitol Hill Days last year, which is wonderful. Um, and Hannah is going to be giving a presentation about those two site visits on February 9th. So I would encourage you to um, sign up to attend those. She's got a lot of really wonderful photos that she'll be sharing and stories of the people that she met and the projects that she observed. Um, and so the, the, the primary job that Hannah does for us here is um, higher education outreach. So slightly different from pop ed in that even though she is speaking to classrooms full of college students, they're college students who are in classes typically um, related to the environment in some way. So ecology or, um, well, probably mostly that, but environmental science. And she sends out emails at the beginning of every semester asking professors if they would like to invite her to speak to their classrooms. And she gets a lot of positive responses. And as you can see last year, she spoke to nearly a hundred college classes ac across the country. Um, she gets amazing feedback. Um, the professors always write afterwards to say that the students were really engaged and that they've never seen their students have such robust conversations after, after a speaker has left. And you can see one of the testimonials here. This is just a screenshot from our website, which is the um, sign up form that professors can use if they want to request a speaker. Um, and then last summer, a lot of you probably attended this, but um, Hannah also uh, hosted a four-part virtual demography series over the course of the summer, and those um, the recordings from that are all available on our website. So if you missed it when they were running live, you can go back and watch them now if you would like. What else did I want to talk about? Okay, last thing um, that I wanted to mention is our global partners program. So for, I guess, well, how many years? Seven years now, I guess, since 2016. We have been making small grants to just a handful of um, organizations. Uh, CTPH, you probably heard us talk about many, many times. It's um, Conservation Through Public Health based in Uganda. Um, Gladys Kalima Zikusoka is the founder and um, president of that organization. She's a wildlife veterinarian. She's also on our board now, um, which is really wonderful. Um, so that was our first partner organization. And then WINGS um, was one of our early partner organizations as well. That's based in Guatemala. And we actually um, were able to get the president of that organization to join our board as, as well, Rodrigo Barillas. Um, and since then, uh, and through the generosity of our donors, we've been able to expand that program to now include 19 different small locally based NGOs that are uh, across Sub-Saharan Africa, um, a couple in Latin America, and a couple in South Asia. And we try to choose organizations that are doing work on the ground, like direct service work um, that works toward our mission of population stabilization, but because we aren't a direct service organization, um, we can't do the work in the settings where these organizations exist um, the way that they can. And so it's a, it's a wonderful partnership. Um, it's a way for them to be able to do more receiving money from us. Um, but it's also, it's mutually beneficial because they provide stories and photos for us to use when we are, um, you know, when we're trying to, sorry, I'm getting some hands raised. I just want to make sure that I'm not going over or something. Um, but uh, yeah, it's really helpful for us to have, um, you know, real stories to share when we're doing our advocacy outreach or any kind of communications, just to be able to talk about the ways that, um, you know, assistance in, in some of the countries in the world that have, you know, the least resources um, can just make all like all the difference in people's lives, um, but also in the trajectory 
within those countries of, um, you know, health indicators and poverty alleviation and stuff like that. So we're really proud of this program. It's, it's still sort of in its nascent phase. Um, it's, it's pretty new, but uh, we, yeah, we were hoping to continue growing it. And um, yeah, we want to thank all of you who donated to the matching gift campaign that was at the end of 2022. Um, we were able to raise a lot of money for some of these organizations. Um, and I just wanted to mention, if you're curious about learning more about these organizations, we do um, have Olivia's currently putting up web pages um, on our website about each one and also conducting a Q&A with each organization and posting those as blogs um, on our website. So you can find a lot more information about those organizations there. And I think I'll stop there. And I, I see that there are tons of messages. So apologies if I've gone over. Um, stop my share. Okay. Thank you, Marianne. No, you were great on time. And I'm very Good. glad we ended on the Global Partners uh, program because um, in the upcoming year, we will be having a series where we will have our partners present on the work that they're doing on the ground. So we will get to know um, them much more and we hope you can join us. I will follow up with more information. So don't you worry, you'll have the links to register, um, everything you'll need to know. But since we have very limited time, let's go ahead and jump into a quick Q&A session. We do have a lot of questions. Um, so starting off, I'm just looking here at what's been submitted live. It looks like, Pam, this would be best suited for you. We have somebody asking, are there any opportunities for substitute teachers? Um, so the, the teachers who are in our network, um, they tend to be um, folks that, that work with um, science and social studies primarily. So I know a lot of so substitute teachers go where, wherever they're needed. Um, but we really are looking for people who um, who see the place population studies fit into their content. Um, so I would say if you're a regular sub for, for science or social studies classes, um, that, that might work. But I know a lot of subs go just wherever they're needed. Thank you. And I will keep you on for one more question. Um, do you encounter any resistance uh, to teaching teachers and how do you approach that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I would describe our program as something sort of that teachers opt into. Um, we don't get pop ed adopted by like school districts. It, these are supplemental materials that teachers themselves choose to use. So in that sense, we're not getting you know, resistance from school districts. Um, when we go to conferences, the teachers that come to our sessions are ones who are, who are interested in what we're doing. But sometimes if we're doing um, a mandatory professional development in a school district or uh, a, a class for teaching method students, there might, there might be some who are not, not so into what, <laughs> what, what we have, um, but we, as much as we can, we tie our materials to content standards that are prescribed for, for educators by their, their states. And so we're showing them, okay, this is not something additional to teach. This is not a fringe topic. This is, this is really part of, of what your content standards um, are, are asking you to teach as a teacher. So as much as we can show them that it, it, it fits what they're looking for, um, then uh, not a lot of resistance. And I know I said that was the last one, but one more for you, Pam. You did mention that um, about the workshops and the conferences. Are there other ways that you recruit teachers to use the pop and materials? Um, so a lot of teachers are, you know, finding materials uh, through their Google searches and, and coming onto our website through social media. Um, Marion talked about uh, social media for population connection as an organization. Uh, we also have social media accounts for the population education program. So there are teacher groups and they find materials that way as well. Um, so I would say, you know, we do a lot of digital outreach. Uh, we, do, we do Google ads and Facebook ads and, you know, all the ways that we try to, to reach anybody these days. Um, you know, we, we try to do that through, through teacher channels too and let them know um, what we have. We also do about... Um, more than half of the workshops we do are for 
future teachers. So we do a lot of outreach to university faculty in colleges of education all over the US and Canada. Um, so that's that's often um, a teacher's first introduction to us is when they're when they're studying to get their teacher certification. All right, thank you, Pam. Uh, looking at a few of the pre-submitted questions, um, Marion, I don't know if you wanted, I know you briefly mentioned the latest reports from um, about population data from China. Did you have any comments or plans to write some op-eds in the following weeks? Yeah, so we um, we did write three letters to the editor at the beginning of the week and sent those off. If we don't hear back within a week, that's pretty much an indication that the answer is no and that they will not be published. Um, uh, but Olivia is working on a blog this week uh, in response to not only the news that China's population has peaked, but also in response to the way the news was reported. Um, and that blog post, I would imagine, would be ready today, definitely by tomorrow. Um, so you'll be able to look on our blog and find that. And um, she always does a really good job of including links and breaking things down in a way that is really easy to understand. So for sure, look for that. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, what do we have next? I'll leave this open to any of our speakers. Um, any advice you have on how can we carry on conversations about our planet survival and sustainability without shutting folks off when we mention the population and carrying capacity of our Earth? Do we have any takers? I'll go since I was just talking. Um, we in the communications team anyway, it's very important to us to make sure to always talk about it in a rights-based um, framework. You know, as an organization, we've never we've never promoted, you know, coercive measures or any sort of top-down measures, um, you know, government controls or anything. It's all about individual choice and opportunity to, you know, choose the family size that people want for themselves. And I think that once people realize that, you know, they might be a little reticent to talk about population if they think that what that means is that we want like a one-child policy, like what China used to have, because the, you know, the opportunities for um, for human rights abuses are so great when there's a program like that in place. Um, and when they realize that that is absolutely not what we're advocating for, we just wanna make sure that everybody who wants to use family planning has access and the ability to do so. Um, I think people kind of soften to the topic and are then able to have a conversation about it. So I don't know, that usually works for us. I know Hannah probably encounters that a little bit more than Olivia and I do just because she speaks to people, you know, I mean, it's over Zoom, but in person. Um, and she finds that college students are really receptive to the messages that she's sharing. So I think there is a way to do it um, that doesn't turn people off, but I don't know if anybody else has different experiences than that. No, I would definitely agree, Marianne. And I think the way um, to also bridge that gap in fields is talking about people want access to family planning and people on the ground around the world see the connection between their environmental changes, climate resiliency, and their local populations in the demography of their area, right? It's not, so I think when you're able to talk about it is it's not me coming from New York City saying that, you know, someone in the Philippines should do something. It's, it's really me learning from, for example, PATH Philippines, hearing what they want and need, and then using that in my legislative and advocacy work. And I think people are really excited about the concept of helping people have agency and advocacy um, when they might when when they're asking us for it right so I think it's it's always taking that right based rights based lens and really helping folks understand that it's it's not us telling people what they need to do we are listening to what people want around the world and helping them achieve that very well put thank you Yasmin and Marianne um, so that leads me to what will probably be our final question since we are quickly approaching the hour. Um, how has your organization integrated sexual and reproductive health and rights, family planning, and climate change into its program to conserve the environment? I know each of you touched very quickly on what you've been doing, such as Capitol Hill Days. We've got speakers who are working in the field of conservation. 
Is there anything um, you would like to add before we end this uh, presentation? Pam, are you about to unmute? It looked like maybe you were leaning forward to, no, okay. Um, I mean, we don't have a conservation program. I think that's the simplest answer. You know, like I mentioned earlier, we're not a direct service organization, meaning that we don't provide health services, but we also um, aren't, you know, a land trust. Uh, so we're, we don't have programs like that. Of course, um, through our education and advocacy, we have to figure out how to talk about family planning and its, con its potential contributions to conserving habitats. Um, you know, one of the, the, I don't know if anybody had looked at the Living Planet report that um, WWF puts out every couple of years, but it just came out a couple of months ago. And it says that the largest contributor to biodiversity loss is habitat loss. And why does habitat loss occur? You know, a big part of it is humans encroaching into forests or whatever the habitat is. Um, and I think like Yasmin said, you know, people who are, are living in high fertility, high population growth places are seeing that happening around them. Like they're the ones that are noticing there's less fish in the sea for them to catch and eat, you know, and sell at the market. And there are fewer, um, you know, fewer animals in the woods for when they want to go hunting and stuff. So, you know, I think just talking about it in a way that, um, Again, it's just it's just all about rights. That's all. It's just, you know, making people able to do what they want to do with their own bodies, within their own families, um, and giving them the resources to be able to do that. And I think that that's just that that's it. It's just it's very simple, actually. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Um... So on that note, I do want to thank everyone for tuning in. Thank you to our speakers for presenting and sharing all of these um, updates that were made possible by our incredible network of supporters. Uh, as I mentioned, I will be in touch early next week with a link to view a recording of this presentation. Um, I'll also provide more information on our upcoming global partner series that we briefly mentioned, uh, where we'll be showing our or showcasing our international partners all year long. We'll learn more about the work they're doing on the ground. Um, so thank you again, and I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thanks, now. everyone. Bye.